Canadian leaders must tell people, whether it gets votes or not, that um, vigilance about the world and Canada's place in it is important and that they have a vision for it. Welcome back to the Northern Sentinels podcast and the second half of my discussion with Canadian diplomat Robert Fowler. In this episode, Bob speaks about Rwanda, his final years in the public service, being kidnapped by Al-Qaeda in Niger, and some insights on national security. Thanks for listening, and without delay, here's my conversation with Bob Fowler. What was your involvement as the the DM uh, in in Rwanda, noting that it was a UN mission, but we had a a Canadian general uh, leading the the military component of the mission on the ground. So I've got to, I've got to admit that. So I went off to Rwanda to see how General Dallaire was doing and to see the circumstances in which he was doing it. But yes, I'll admit that I have a I had a particular interest in Rwanda, which I'd had since I taught there. Um, what what was it? Um, Thirty years earlier. Um, and I had views on uh, Rwanda as a bellwether for Africa and beyond. But so uh, the deputy chief of defense staff, Admiral Larry Murray, and I went off to see what was what. Uh, but I suppose if I examined that very closely, I would have to say my my deputy's interest was not enormously clear. Now, again, I mentioned, I think, earlier that one of the deputy's duties is ensuring that what defense does is more or less in keeping with what the government writ large wants and needs and has decreed within that box. And obviously, um, the reality of what was happening in Rwanda was just beginning to seep through into the public consciousness and the fact that we we had 500 people there and the general in charge was going to um, be more and more visible as the horror of what was happening seeped out. And yes, it, it was... Uh, coming a year after Somalia, uh, with all the um, uh, residual feelings about Somalia, and was this going to be Somalia too, in some manner or other? So that was that was very much within my purview, as it were. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, uh, we went there and and determined that General Dallaire was doing an a remarkable job for which neither he nor his troops, uh, both Canadian and other, were um, prepared for, trained for, um, but they were doing as as best they could and rather effectively. I think General Dallaire still kicks himself that he wasn't able to stop the slaughter of Ten thousand people every night for a hundred year uh, for a hundred days, but he did save twenty five thousand people, which most of us can't claim to have mm-hmm. done. Um, and um, uh, he did manage this very unhappy situation as best he could. Um, and uh, we did then manage to come back and make recommendations, which would allow General Toussignon to take over from. Um, General Dallaire and uh, uh, Canada to keep two Herks in operation, keeping that mission alive, and then replacing it with uh, communicators and other support forces um, uh, to to ensure the continuing viability of that mission. I think one of the one of the things that people probably continue to be perplexed by is the 
um, the lack of action of the international community to to intervene in, in Rwanda. And based on all of your experience at the UN, your experience in defense, your experience in Africa, I mean, you've got, a, I think, a very learned perspective on a number of key components of this. Can, can you give some of you know, your thoughts on, you know, why this ended up perhaps unfolding to the extent that it did, the genocide? Yeah, I think so. And I thought a lot about it, Chris. So first of all, uh, that little force of Delaire's was deployed to Rwanda for, with, with, with no thought that such a thing could happen or be happening. In fact, after a number of years of rather low-grade war, where Paul Kagame's Tutsis from Uganda uh, refugees were coming down from the north and were attacking the um, the Hutu regime, and uh, I was all too aware of the history of tribal struggles in Rwanda. Um, and most people weren't and still aren't. But it was a very significant issue, about as volatile as any tribal issue anywhere in the world that I know of. But Rwanda is not unique in that regard in Africa, but maybe one of the most extreme cases. Anyway, that was happening, and I mean it was relatively low-grade, and then there were peace talks, and the UN sent in the small force basically to guarantee the security of the peace talks. Basically a guard around the table, the discussion. Right. That's all. They were security there. Security bubble. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, that's all. And it was a pretty modest force uh, even to do that. But it was pretty modest. And even, I don't, I mean, the um, Security Council uh, agreed to it because they have to agree to that kind of mm-hmm. thing. It wasn't a big deal. I mean, it was, way. Well, well, finally, peace talks are happening, and isn't it a nice thing, and we'll do what we could to smile upon the peace talks and, and to indicate international concern and attention for what's happening and get it done. And then Delaire and his excellent people, including a, a bunch of terrific uh, uh, Senegalese uh, intelligence officers, began to feel the the tension the the tribal tensions rise and uh, tried to get headquarters attention to that fact but headquarters wasn't much interested why didn't the un react stronger well it's back to the four maps somalia so you remember on television warrant officer will durant had been bounced naked through the streets of Mogadishu after the helicopter down fiasco with U.S. Special Forces in Mogadishu Mm -hmm. a year before. It was a huge embarrassment to the United States and to United States forces and particularly to Special Forces because it was a fiasco. Indeed, they wrote a book called that. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a fiasco from every perspective. Uh, so we'd had our Somalia fiasco. They'd had their very public Somalia fiasco. And clearly, in the minds of Washington, they said, never again. We don't do Africa. And by the way, Somalia has lots of seaports and airports. Rwanda is about as difficult a place from a logistic point of view, to get near. My opposite number in the Security Council was Madeleine Albright. And Madeleine, who I got to know very well, so Madeleine said in a Security Council debate, when you said, why didn't people notice? Why didn't people care? very similar parallels to a number of things going on today. 
So the world was becoming more and more aware of the depth of the horror in Rwanda. Europeans particularly, and North Americans not much. But Stern magazine had big color photos of piles of bodies 30 feet high. So Madeleine allowed in a public debate, there may have been genocidal acts, but there was no, there's no genocide in Rwanda. So why did she say that? She said that because the Americans had passed a law saying that where there is genocide, they must intervene by law to stop genocide. Therefore, there was no genocide. Very similar situations elsewhere in the world today. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Canada, same thing. Okay, we had Romeo out there in a place that we didn't know where it was or know much about. Uh, we remembered Somalia. Um, how interested was Canada to go off into a much even more difficult situation in Rwanda to to do what? To fight whom? To, you know. I mean, Romeo claimed that with an armored brigade, he could have stopped the whole thing. I think he's right. I mean, the, the genocide in Rwanda... Who, who had AKs, preferred to use their machete. They didn't all have AKs by any means, right. but, but those who actually had a choice of weapon chose the hydraulic one. Mm. They wanted to make it up close and personal. The Tutsis are very tall people. They actually actually cut them down to size. They chopped their their legs off below the knee to before they killed them, to cut them down the side. Um, I mean, we didn't understand any of it. Uh, why did the world not react? Well, uh, move to Europe. Um, the French had been supporting the Hutus because the Tutsis had been the pals of the Americans, of the English-speaking world. Rwanda was going English. France wanted to keep it French. They supported the Hutus. When they sent in Operation Turquoise, immediately in July, immediately after the genocide, they basically cordoned off the lower left-hand quadrant of Rwanda as a safe zone safe for Hutus. And the genocide escaped into French protection. Um, uh, and, and that is a vivid reality. So it, within Europe, among the countries that could care and do something, the French were engaged. The Brits, hey, wait a minute, we got a problem in, in Sierra Leone and other places that were ours that we like to keep sort of ours. Um, and no, no, they, this is Belgian, French. No, no, we don't, we don't want anything to do with it. Uh, and we North Americans, remember Somalia? We don't, well, Africa, they do, they like that in Africa. You know, we, we don't want, we don't want, we don't want to get engaged in that. None of that good, good reason or good excuse for letting happen what happened. But that's how it happened. Yeah, yeah quite a busy time in defense. <laughs> and we'd already, we'd spoken about your time as our, yeah. uh, as our ambassador to the United Nations. What were the conditions where you decided to, well, I'll say retire, but not really retire, <laughs> yeah. but to, to leave the public service? Well, um, so after, after New York, um, I guess what, I'd done 20 months of our 24 months on the council. Um, 
the kind of tradition is that um, you change jobs in the summer and um, and uh, and I knew my pal Paul Heinbecker uh, from Foreign Affairs very much wanted to get a taste of the Security Council. I'd had my full taste, and and at the risk of sounding a little bit complacent, um, in those twenty months I'd sort of done what I wanted to do on the council. Um, we anchored the human security thinking with some controversy in the council's activities. You can still see it today. If you wanted, I could talk to you about that. Uh, Angola had basically been done. We'd, we'd stopped the flow of money to the rebels through managing changes in the diamond trade. Um, we'd got the world to recognize that there was a legitimate winner and uh, a very illegitimate pers- uh, outfit that should be a loser. And the supporters of that loser had accepted that fact. So I I left for one more posting in August. Paul took over at the beginning of September, um, and we left the council at the end of that year. So I went off to Rome, uh, where I'd wanted to go, where I could continue to keep my UN hand in because the, the three... UN food agencies exist in Rome, uh, the World Food Program, the Food and Agricultural Organization, and a small kind of boutique outfit called the International Fund for Agricultural Development that invests in innovative agriculture for the third world. Uh, In addition, with Rome comes a package where you are High Commissioner to Malta, an ambassador to Albania, an ambassador, must not forget, to San Marino. Okay. Um, uh, Um which uh, there used to be a Grand Prix of San Marino, but San Marino is too small actually to have a Grand Prix, so um, it was elsewhere in in Italy. Anyway, um, and uh, so I went to to Rome, and uh, not even a year later, eight months later, I was asked uh, by Prime Minister Christian to come back and prepare the the summit, uh, G8 summit that Canada would host in Kananaskis. And uh, so I would be in charge of both the organization of it and the substance uh, organized. There's a, quite an elaborate GH system for doing all that. And and remember, uh, so my first day in the office was right across the river there in that building. And I walked into my office, big office, <laughs> met, met the crew that would be helping me, saw there was a TV in the corner, turned it on, and over Peter Jennings' shoulder, I watched the second plane hit the World Trade Center. Literally, that, like that, I hadn't sat down at my desk, and I realized that my job had changed. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Kananaskis meeting was going to be the first big, high-profile international meeting after 9-11. So security was a big deal. And boy, we did big deals in terms of security for Ken Matthews. Um Your time in defense must have been very, very helpful. It was very helpful. I, mean, I, I will not in this go into detail, but, but just let me throw out a... So the Ken Askis site, my, my numbers may be a little off here, okay, but it was um, 48 seconds flight away from run from one runway at the Calgary Airport, and uh, I think two and a half minutes away from another, from the other runway. Okay. And here were the leaders of the eight major powers going to be in one plate, mm-hmm. a, a target-rich environment. And um, how do you? secure that place from some plane taking off from Calgary and and doing a World Trade Center. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, I mean, that was a that was a big challenge. Was that the last your last sort of major task in the public service? No, no. Cuz I mean I did that so I was here for a year Mary stayed in in Rome where she was working for the World Food Program and traveling all over the world. Uh, So I saw her twice in that year, back in Italy, because we had meetings in Italy. And then I went back to Italy to kind of resume my posting and kind of start it again. But uh, I took back with me uh, a key G8 role, 
which was personal representative of the Prime Minister for Africa. And each of the G8 countries had one of those. And we met all over Africa um, three or four times a year to uh, keep thinking about what the G8 was going to do about Africa and what the G8 would recommend to other people to do about Africa. And at Kananaskis, we had the, the... the G8 leaders had agreed something uh, called the, the the G8 Action Plan, which was 110 specific commitments for Africa. And so the, the G8 personal representatives were going to kind of oversee the implementation of all that. And Canada started with a half billion dollar fund to do that, to our part, our initial slice of the implementation of that fund. So until I retired, that is, for another six years, I was that. So I spent an awful lot of time in Africa. And then uh, in 2005, um, I got a call from then um, Prime Minister Martin um, asking me to do what I could to fix Darfur. So um, I became the chair of the Prime Minister's advisory team on Darfur, which included um, Senator Dallaire and Senator Mobina Jaffer. And the three of us, the three of us um, were sent off to do what we could about Darfur, because it was, that was following on from Rwanda, etc. Um, Darfur is happening. Uh, the word genocide is being used. Uh, what can, should, will Canada do to mitigate that horror? And uh, we had a budget of $200 million. uh, More if necessary, and we could make a case for it, but basically um, we said we can't do it by just nice words, so what is it? So basically what we did was work with the African Union to set up an African Union peacekeeping force in Darfur. And we provided them with um, 200 armored vehicles and had a hell of a time trying to get them armed uh, um, and uh, get export permits for uh, heavy machine guns and, and, and 762s to, to um, be mounted on those newly white-painted um, uh, uh, armored vehicles mm-hmm. that the Army said they didn't need anymore. Um, and uh, then help set up the structure and the political environment in which that peacekeeping force would operate in a country, Sudan, uh, where they didn't want them at all. Not even a bit. Mm-hmm. And they didn't want the UN. They didn't want me uh, and our senators, Dallaire and Jaffer. And they didn't want the peacekeeping force. So how to convince that country that they were going to enjoy it um, was another, another challenge. So that, that was just, that lasted a year. And then the next year, I came home and retired. How many years did that make it when you retired from public service? 39, I think, something like that. So four four decades. Yeah. And you spent four decades in service, and, I mean, a, a uh, a remarkable career. What were the conditions where you decided that you would return to service uh, and for the UN. How, how long were you sort of off, and what, what were the conditions where you said, hmm, I need to go and do this now? So it was about oh, uh, a year and three quarters after I'd retired. I was doing some teaching at the University of Ottawa um, at a terrific school called the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa, having a great deal of fun there, uh, dealing with very bright students and a terrific professorial staff, and doing kind of as much or as little as I wanted to do there. Um, And then the UN came to me in the summer of 08, right out of the blue, uh, I think at the instigation of what had been a great pal of mine, he still is a pal despite all that, 
uh, named Haile Menkerias, who was, when I was at the UN, he was the um, Ethiopian ambassador to the UN. Brilliant guy. And he was the sort of uh, uh, ADM, no, no, he would have been the DG Africa under the ADM Paul of the UN, which is the, the political affairs division of the UN. And he, and you have to give him every credit for prescience, he had decided that the situation in, in West Africa, particularly the Sahel region, and that's the, the, the edge of the Sahara, uh, stretching 7,000 kilometers from Nouakchott in Mauritania to Mogadishu in, in Somalia, he had decided that that area was uh, significantly unstable, that the area was uh, under enormous environmental peril as uh, desertification caused the Sahara to sweep southward, mm -hmm. that it contained, um, I think, again, from the top of my head, Chris, uh, seven of the ten poorest countries in the world that contained uh, a similar proportion of the countries most uh, beset with uh, exploding population and the incapability to deal with that. And most significantly, uh, both tribal and religious divisions that were going to tear it apart. And the immediate cause was something called the Second Tuareg Rebellion that was taking place in northern Niger. Niger, the third largest country in Africa. Uh, three quarters of which is in the Sahara. And the only place where you can grow anything is in that bottom quarter and there not much and increasingly less so uh he the un felt that this what was a mi relatively minor rebellion two or three hundred people were being killed a year i mean in the grand scheme of things this was not huge but worrisome and very much worrisome that it would grow and not remain within that region. And it would not necessarily remain an issue between Tuaregs and, and the governments to the south, although that was very much the immediate cause. Um, and I won't bore you with all the enormous, again, tribal issues, but um, the Tuaregs... Uh, are, are viewed very romantically by the Europeans. Les hommes bleus. Uh, there's even, you know, um, Tintin dans le Sahara with, um, you know, legionnaires behind little crenellated white forts and mm -hmm. guys in blue with flashing silver sabers on white horses charging towards them. I mean, uh, a long history of that sort of thing. And uh, so they received outward support. Um, so what could we do to stop that? So I was given that mission um, and a, a very big rank and told that I could have a supporter, a somebody who would help me do this. And the UN offered me a list of people who I didn't like um, and uh, asked foreign affairs if I could have one of theirs. Uh, seconded I, uh, to me at the UN, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, as a UN. And they seconded Louis Gay, who had been an ambassador in West Africa, and uh, he was Francophone, and this was a Francophone area, and uh, seemed to be perfectly... Louis joined slightly after me. I, I'd met him, but I didn't know him very well, and was happy to have him come on board. He was excited, too. So he became seconded to the UN, and uh, off we went. So what was the motive, what was the real motivation? I mean, you can be asked, but you've done forty years of public service, yeah. you're now teaching. 
what what is the motivation then to sort of pick up and you know once more into the fold well it so- it sounds crazy and and impossibly distressingly egoistic but i had to, i had to concur that i was probably well suited to the task i mean i'd spent an awful lot of time in and around africa at the macro level Unlike most of my colleagues, I mean, I had not spent 20 years living in Africa at various posts, Mm. Um, but I had visited, I don't know, pretty close to 40 of the 54 African countries and and dealt with heads of government in most of them and and had a kind of a, a good macro view of African issues and African tensions and how Africa related to the rest of the world. And to the UN. Uh, so, um, I, in other words, when I got asked, I had, I kind of agreed that I probably, somebody like me would be the right kind of person. Um, the terms of reference were very vague. Basically, learn about it, stop the war if you can, report back on its broader implications, let us know what we need to know about this area. So off we went. Um, It was not an area that I knew. I'd never set foot in Niger before. Uh, I had been in Mali, but uh, as part of the G8 thing, but not in Niger. Um, And reading out before I went, I realized the job was going to be particularly difficult because The president of Niger, a former general, and we now know that most countries in that region are run by former generals, and the first job of a former general in taking over the government in any of these countries is to ensure that all generals are happy, (laughs) and that is to ensure that they get the biggest slice of the small pie available to these countries and keep it. And uh, General Tanja, now President Tanja, hated the UN with a passion. Uh, The year before, uh, the number two at the World Food Program had given an interview to the BBC in which he said uh, two-thirds of the country were starving. Uh, The President uh, President Tanja didn't like that, so he expelled the World Food Program. Of course, it was true, but... um, I mean, the first job of a president is to um, feed his people. Um, He clearly wasn't doing that, and uh, therefore get rid of the people who said he should be doing it. Uh, He he hated the UN, and here I was, the um, special representative of the UN, coming to tell him how to um, stop a war, a low-grade war going on way up in the north of his country. he had no intention of stopping the war. Uh, that was the enemy at the gate. And that justified giving all the money to the military, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and keep on giving the money, money to the military, who, by the way, had no interest in going up there and fighting the rebels. Um, uh, because it's far up there and it's hot and it's unpleasant and um, it, it isn't um, down when the military are getting all the budget. Uh, so um, he didn't want that. He didn't want anybody interfering with his business. Um, and uh, nor did the most important player in the region, which was Algeria. Uh, Algeria has long considered that whole area their manifest destiny. And if anything is going to happen in that region, it's going to be because they want it to. The special UN representative for that region, was an Algerian. Um, And he had the same rank I did, and he was enormously annoyed that behind his back, I had been appointed to fix one of his territories that um, he had no intention of fixing. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was the... Oh, oh, by the way, then there was Gaddafi in in Libya. Um, And uh, the only thing that kept... Algeria's regional intentions somewhat in check was the fact that um, uh, 
uh, the guide had his own intentions in that area and would travel around with aides carrying two huge suitcases of cash, um, which they would leave at appropriate places. So that was the environment I was working in. <laughs> How do you even start to uh, define or work towards some form of a solution with problem that complex? Well, you first meet the president and you take a bet with your aide that um, there's a 50-50 chance that within an hour we will be at the air- airport as he throws us out of the country. Really? Mm-hmm. 50-50. I think. Yeah. Well, we survived that meeting, but just barely. And then we met various of his ministers, uh, some of whom were somewhat friendly, most of whom were not. Uh, then we um, met everybody else, including Tuareg leaders, northern leaders. We went up to the north, visited all around. We went to this famous place where the French are getting a great deal of their uranium and supposedly the locus of Saddam's yellow cake. You remember the, I do. the, the would-be weapons of mass destruction. And Arlet was my first introduction to the Sahara, and it was like a science fiction show with a with a kind of space bubble on the moon. There was no bubble, but this little enclave around this huge mine that had been in operation for 40 years, and beyond it, nothing. Absolutely horrible, desolate, dangerous, nothing. Um, anyway, uh, then we contrived to meet with the rebels, which under Niger law is punishable by life imprisonment. Uh, anybody meeting or talking to, and they nailed a number of journalists and put them in jail. Mm. So we arranged to meet with them in Geneva. And uh, basically, not the top guy, but their kind of foreign minister as if they had such a structure. but uh, And they were quite amenable to doing a deal. I, I said it was the second Tuareg Rebellion. Of course, there'd been a first Tuareg Rebellion. In fact, there'd been rebellions before the first Tuareg Rebellion, each of which ended in a deal in which they got some. Right. <laughs> so they, they, were, they wanted the deal. Mm-hmm. So we had, we had them prepared to make a deal, and I was able for the UN to offer all facilitation for a deal. I mean, we would set up a place to meet somewhere, probably in Europe with a nice hotel, (laughs) Um, and probably discussions that wouldn't be quick, Um, and then there'd be a deal. And that might attract a little foreign funding and whatever. I was interested in whether the the mining revenues of the French and a Canadian company, gold mining company, and a oil explorer, that some of those um, mining revenues might be siphoned off towards the deal. Uh, in other words, it wouldn't necessarily engage the general's slice. There could be additional revenues there that would nourish the deal. And that's when I got kidnapped. <laughs> so, yeah. And how long were you held captive, you and Louis held captive for? 130 days. In, we, we stayed about half that time in one place. And then uh, the second half in 23 or four other places. So in the second half, we were constantly on the move. Um, and uh, they, they could, I, they have lessons to teach the Canadian forces. These these guys could decamp in five minutes, and did often, because I mean they had very limited needs, um, and they carried everything they needed to live and fight, in the on the in the bed of their Toyota Hilux trucks, and uh, I mean their their agility was remarkable. And of course, their uh, their purpose and their focus was uh, absolute. Uh, they knew what they were fighting for. They would say, "We fight to die, and you fight to go home to your wives and kids." 
Who's going to win? What's more, we're fighting God's fight. God can't lose, obviously. The only issue is when. And that's not our business, and we must not, cannot, and will never speculate upon that, inshallah. How important was it to have uh, somebody else in captivity with you? Vital. Absolutely vital. Chris, I don't know. I mean, Louis and I are massively different people. And, uh, and, and, and our adventure together in the desert proved how different we were. Thank God we were different. Imagine if we were the same, we would have killed each other. Um, so somebody to talk to, somebody to worry over, somebody to save, somebody to correct. I mean, me saving him, him saving me. I mean, uh, they separated us for four days, and they were not good days. They always, whenever we moved, we were obviously, we were put in different trucks, obviously, eggs and different baskets. Um, and uh, every time we were separated, we wondered if that was the last time we'd see each other type thing. Um, so very important. Yeah. I'm very much as, yeah. it won't be a surprise to, to you or probably to yeah. any of my friends listening, I'm very much a... Uh, someone who has a a routine uh, and it gives me great comfort and it grounds me. uh, Yes. And and I know from reading your book that you, you both established a a routine. Can you maybe walk us through that routine a little bit and talk about uh, the importance of that in spending uh, or surviving captivity? Yeah. Well, we we did have a routine because I'm like you. Uh, I think routine gave me a lot of, um, Structure, and uh, in a in a utterly structureless situation. Um, so I am. If I had to define, I mean, assuming I had some skill set, if I had to define it, I would I would say I'm a geostrategic analyst. I mean, that's what I've done more than anything in every job I've had, and I kept geostrategically analyzing our situation. And coming up with really bad answers, <laughs> and so I'd analyze it again and come up with more bad answers. And Louis would, say, Louis would say, "Who Louis? Who's an optimist?" And Louis would say, "Well, you know, uh, they, you know, they've got thirty guys here looking after us. They've got places to go and people to kill, and um, they're going to get fed up with holding us. And uh, in a humanitarian gesture, they will let us go." And I, I would say, Louis, these guys don't do humanitarian gestures. That would ruin their trademark. I mean, they, by definition, they have to be the meanest bastards in the valley. That's who they are. If, if they lose that, they're nothing. Um, so no, no humanitarian gestures. And then we, we'd go around that in many ways. So we, we, we kind of figured some kind of healthy mind, healthy body, and uh, we would worry that if one or the other went, uh, the other would follow suit quickly. So we had to do some uh, exercise, uh, but it was often 50 degrees. Um, I know it was 50 degrees because in Darfur, I had experienced 52, and um, the soles of my Kodiak hiking boots had fallen off because the glue had melted. Um, so I, we didn't have thermometers in the desert, but I, it was like that. Um, and therefore we couldn't walk around in the sun and we were given a prison kind of, you know, from that rock to that bush to this tree. Um, and there'd be, um, two armed people and, a and a, and a light machine gun on a high point always wherever we were. Um, and it was absolutely clear that there, the operating instructions, the orders were, no matter what happens, they go first. It was clear from everything they did and said. So we would walk uh, a little course um, to do four to six kilometers a day, and we would walk just before sunrise and at sunset to get that in and go originally a very small course 19 circuits to the kilometer get dizzy almost 
And then Louis would bring a stick and he would mark you know, like the Count of Monte Cristo, you know, um, uh, as he as we walked around in the sand. Um, and uh, so we did that for health. Um, I mean, the food was awful. The water was worse. Um, they were very menacing, particularly the young one. They had uh, three or four very uh, prepubescent boys uh, who, to me anyway, they were clearly expendables who were going to be fitted with martyrs' vests and sent into a market somewhere. But in the meantime, they were shahid. They were, they were favored, special people um, who were... Um, going to be mollycoddled on their way to martyrdom. And they would, you know, walk over us at night and um, um, scream and yell and throw stones and, I mean, do silly little things to, because to show they were tough. And the others would not. The others were prevented from doing it by order of the boss, uh, Mokhtar Bill Mokhtar, uh, the younger ones were free to do it. How did your your thinking about because the, the group was uh, Al Qaeda in the Maghreb in the Islamic Maghreb in the Islamic yeah. Maghreb? Uh, so before you were taken hostage, how did your maybe how did your thinking about the organization, um, their purpose, their objectives, how did it evolve? I never, time. I'd never heard of them before I was captured to begin with. Okay, never heard of. Them. We were captured almost six hundred kilometers further south than they had ever operated. Uh, they were not a force. In fact, um, five, six days into captivity, they said we're going to make a video, and I said, "Oh yeah, I know about this. This is the proof of life video that they're going to make." Um, um, and uh, I thought they were going to have have us read some horrible screed about how just was their cause and all that stuff. Uh, but no, I said, "What do you? What, what's this about? What do you want us to say?" And there's a video. What you, oh, they said, "Just say who you are and who we are, and uh, um, come and save you." Or, no, sorry, not come and save you. Uh, work out a deal or help. And I said, well, if I'm going to do that, you'd better tell me who you are. That, then there was a big debate as they talked among themselves as to who they were. Were they in the Islamic Maghreb? Were they in the Maghreb? Were they Al-Qaeda? Were they, and, and they had a big discussion, a tough discussion. They finally came up with, and I think that's when the term, that's when their name was invented. They have a long history, of, but under different names. Right. Uh, so they said, no, no, we're Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. No, I said, I've been captured by Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Because um, the, the first view in the, in the press and the world was that we had been captured by the rebels that we were negotiating with, which I fervently hoped right. <laughs> um, uh, that then... You know we're going to be free and um, see you in Geneva, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, that was a, so. There is one moment in the book I think where I describe that uh, on kind of the second night that my back was hurting and I'm walking rather than sleeping, as told. And a guy's making you know a, a fire this big and brewing his little cup of tea, and he looks up and says, uh, "So who do you think we are?" I said, "Are you not the movement for justice?" And and uh, he said. I would hang around with amateurs like that. Um, we are Al Qaeda, and that was not a good. Thing. No. So, so anyway, uh, so basically, these guys very quickly. These guys got born in in 1992 in Algiers when um, I visited Algiers with Pierre Trudeau. In 1982 or three, and we'd met President Chadley, and we 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 had been very eloquent about how the glories of democracy, 
and how uh, they really should try it. Um, general uh, President Chadley was a former general in Algeria, and um, yeah, democracy had not been a big part of his agenda. And so we thought it would be a good thing because we love democracy. And uh, so obviously he thought about it carefully for 10 years, and then they tried it. And they do it like the French. They had two, two tours. And uh, the first one, um, you have uh, as many candidates as you want. And um, if anybody gets 50%, then they're president. With lots of candidates, it's unlikely anybody gets 50%. So the second tour is the top two. The top two then have a playoff three weeks later. So on the first tour, the, the Islamist party uh, got 48%. And the other 12, including the party in power, got the rest. And they decided that they, that was enough of democracy, and, um, <laughs> and, and they didn't need the second tour. Right. Uh, and they, the military stayed in power. They have an enormous military, four times larger by my lights than they need, and a much larger security apparatus. Uh, and the Islamists got the gun. And uh, in '92, and they they uh, decided uh, that they would fight jihad, and uh, they were uh, uh, the uh, Salafist uh, uh, front, and then they were the GSPC, and um, uh, they, in fact, in the late '90s, '98, something they grabbed an Air France plane in Algiers with full of passengers, and they were going to fly it into the Eiffel Tower. But they decided they wanted a bigger bang, and they landed in Marseille to fuel up, and the French stormed the plane, and uh, I think one hostage was killed, and all bad guys. Um, a remarkable operation. Mm. Um, but if you think 9-11 was a new thing, um, not at all. No. Not at all. They understood exactly about it. Then these guys published online, it's available, a lessons learned exercise. The jihadi, in detail, this we did wrong, this we did right, this we won't do again, this, it's all there. Um, anyway, um, they would fight government structures, and the government would fight back, and the government dressed up, uh, Algerian government, a whole bunch of guys with big beards and long, dirty jelly buzz, and did appalling things to people, um, uh, stuffing children down wells and stuff, uh, so that the population would rise against the Islamists. Um, anyway, they too were the enemies at the gate and justified this enormous security apparatus in Algeria. Um, people have asked me, what did I think would happen to Mokhtar Abel Mokhtar, my captor? And I would usually say, well, he's going to be dead, most likely, but if he's not, he'll be a colonel in the Algerian security service. Um, um, they they scratch these others back. Uh, so how do I get on to that? <laughs> uh, any, so all, all I'm saying, they were not a new movement, but they changed the name. Right. So uh, they had moved south from Algeria into Mali, where the Algerians would not come. And so they lived in the desert, where no one lives up there in the kind of, the Sahara is larger than the continental United States, and it's vaguely elliptical, and they were in one of the, um, what are they called in an ellipse, the center of one of the two centers of the ellipse on the mm -hmm. other side. I mean, I wouldn't want to discourage anybody from getting out and seeing different parts of the world, but I certainly get a sense that yeah. uh, things are yeah. are far less permissive than they ever used to be. You are so right. That's my my drive from Cairo to Cape Town. Well, yeah, I, I thought a little bit about that when you mentioned <laughs> it's it. Not, it's not quite what it was. There were always bad guys around, but not 
not organized and not so focused and not understanding that um, Westerners are a target for whatever reason. Uh, but so, no, that's absolutely right. And I very regretfully have had to a number of times um, recommend to people and their children, etc., not to go to many places. What do you think it's important for Canadians to understand about uh, defense and security uh, and how it pertains to them, especially when you live in such a, uh, a peaceful and, and stable country as, as Canada? Well, it's a huge dilemma. And when I, when I've thought about really all my life, uh, uh, first of all, mostly from the foreign affairs perspective and, and, you know, one, one, of, one of the great, truisms is, you know, first of all, foreigners don't vote. Um, and secondly, nobody cares about foreign affairs. And um, very much your question is sort of a subset of that. Nobody cares about security affairs. Nobody cares about, and what's more, the Americans are going to do it anyway. Um, I saw a poll very recently. I'll get this wrong. 35% of Canadians between 18 and 32 believe that we don't need to worry about defense because the Americans are going to do it for it. And, and um, the people who most believe in defense are um, old has-beens like me and my generation. So the, the extent of the feeling you're talking about is very deep in our country. Um, Part of it is education, and part of it, I think, is leadership. Um, I, I, am, I am appalled by how little high school kids know about the world and know about Canada in the world and what Canada has done and could do and be. Uh, they're, I mean, it's, they're simply not interested. Uh, in terms of security, they are bedeviled by... The reality that troubled me all my life, and very particularly over nine years in defense, is that we, 40 million people, cannot defend 10 million square kilometers of this land. It's not possible. I've, other people will claim otherwise, perhaps. Uh, I've not met them. Sorry, there is, let, let, me, let, me be, let me be very contentious. There would be a way. And that's the Israeli option, as we would acquire nuclear weapons and say anybody who mess with us gets nuked. Um, is that likely? Um, not even remote. Mm -hmm. But that, at least in the abstract, that would be a way of claiming that we could defend our interests and our territory effectively. But if we're doing it actually with vehicles and planes and boats, um, we can't do it. Um, uh, and it's not going to be half a dozen largely unarmed Arctic patrol vessels, and it's not going to be F-35s with a range less even than an F-18 and a weapons load smaller. <laughs> um, uh, and it's not going to be with 65-ton main battle tank. Mm -hmm. Um so, uh, what do we do? I mean, how do we posture ourselves? So I think it's in the face of that and, and the fact that we are living side by each with this longest defend, undefended border with the most armed up nation in the world. Um, and the combination of those two realities causes people to throw up their hands and say, why bother? Um, not me. It, it drives me crazy. Um, particularly if you look at what I will consider our rather glorious military history. Hasn't, even in detail, it wasn't always that glorious. But we learned, um, sometimes at great cost, uh, but we learned and we got better at it and then we forgot. Um, so we would have to learn again and the big issue is, would we have the time to learn again? Uh, would we have the equipment in a crisis? I mean, I think we discussed the, the most fascinating 
issue for me of the Russian invasion of Ukraine is the extent to which the Ukrainians are fighting well, coupled with, or the Russians are fighting badly, coupled with the desperate need of materiel on the part of the Ukrainians, and the almost complete lack of interest in tooling up to produce more of that equipment, if not for them, for us. I mean, if we are really worried that it could extend into Poland or where else, how ready are we to back up Article 5? If the Ukrainians, if the Ukrainians are spending more 155 shells in a month than America produces in a year, um, how likely is, are we going to be able to deter a major Russian attack against NATO? And that worries me enormously. In other, in other words, that is something we could do. I mean, we Canadians could do, the West could do, NATO could do, is simply uh, retool. But we're not doing that. Do you have any sense of what the conditions would be that would compel uh, us to, to action, to, to make a significant change or to... To see the, the 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 current international security situation for what it is. Well, I would have said what's happening in Ukraine right. would have been a start, and I was clearly very wrong about that. You know, if the Russians decided to roll over our battle group in Latvia, would would that get our attention? I think we'd be really sorry about it. And I think our leaders would say that's a terrible thing and um, Russians must not do that. Mm. Uh, would we immediately throw in whatever else left we had to uh, counter that invasion which would have extended far beyond Latvia? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I, I had something to do with ending our brave lion commitment to northern Norway because I never, ever believed for a moment that we would do it. I never believed that um, despite the fact that some nice Norwegian would go out and start our, all our vehicles every two weeks in the, in the winter, um, that uh, we were going to fly five or 10 or 15,000 people on, onto those, that equipment in northern Norway. I just didn't believe it would happen. Um, I don't think the Norwegians did either. But uh, um, uh, so, so what? What level of a front uh, kind of would it take? Um, I really, I don't know. I mean, I, I assume if my Latvian example or that it would be occurred, we would begin to get serious. I, I, I mean, Chris, is there a plan out there? Is there a plan to get serious? I mean, has, has, has somebody out there in the Canadian government sat down with a pen and pencil and worked out what getting serious would mean? I don't know. No? I, I, don't, know. I don't know. And frankly, I doubt it. Yeah, if... I, if... I, I try not to. I always try to leave a sliver of hope that um, that somebody or multiple people are doing that. And I can certainly say from my my last job in uniform that it was a widely held belief uh, between myself and my colleagues about uh, the need to to be more serious and and not not from a perspective of uh, you know more tanks more ships, more, you know, more military hardware, but just taking a more serious approach to national security issues writ large. And a lot of that is, you know, of course, is policy driven. And, and I don't think it's unique to this government. I think it's, uh, it's certainly got been an enduring challenge in Canada for us to have a serious approach an enduring serious approach to defense and security. But more, but more, more serious means, Details and practicalities. It, it's 
it's more than activating the, the regimental third battalions. I mean, you know, I mean, we've had that on the list for a long time. Um, at the moment, the Canadian forces are 17% deficient in, in agreed positions. Mm -hmm. We can't fill both. Do, do, what would it take to even do that, let, let alone activating our tiny reserve forces? I mean, what shells are we going to fire? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's you. Um, uh, you know, it, we we had we had we had to we had to rent and borrow uh, a, a supply ship so that our our frigates could leave harbor. Um, I don't want to be too depressing or too negative either. But but when I say, are we prepared for something more? I mean, how many rifles? would we need which would be let's begin with 10 times the number we have I, I, how many million rounds of 556 five, ammunition could we produce in what time how long would it take to build the factory because in the in the situation we're talking about other people are going to need what they've got uh so um you asked me sort of uh, sort of what's wrong well education um our our uh, canadian young canadians no canadians but young canadians are not taught about the world they're not taught about history and the regularity with which bad things happen uh the virtual certainty that bad things are going to happen and uh, the need therefore CVs patchum parabellum, um, uh, and 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 the second is leadership. Um, Canadian leaders must tell people whether it gets votes or not that um, vigilance about the world and Canada's place in it is important, and that they have a vision for it. Uh, there is no inkling in my mind of any of that vision present, and I must say, on either side of the house, uh, no, no inkling at all that that an appreciation of the fragility of the world and the thinness of the veneer of civilization is present in the minds of our leaders, let alone their absolute obligation in my mind to to ensure that Canadians understand those realities. So education and leadership. The educate, entertain, or elevate idea is just your chance to make a recommendation on a, if there's a book that you love, uh, has nothing to, could be nothing to do with service or national security. You've got a book that you love, uh, a restaurant in town here, or a, a little hidden gem that would be good for folks. Or if you have a particular charity that speaks to you, so it's really uh, the chance just to share share something unique that, uh, that okay. you can recommend to people. I had somebody recommend that the Chilkoot Trail, doing the Chilkoot Trail uh, as something with, with, with the piano on your back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. She's done it a couple of times. It was actually a really it was a great recommendation. Uh, I, I haven't done it, but I'm a canoeist, and I have certainly enjoyed canoeing the far north of our country. And it's a unique experience and absolutely terrific. Uh, and any amount of that, and I think, therefore, kids at camp going on long canoe trips, etc., that's a good start. Uh, more of that uh, outdoorsy stuff. Um, I, in terms of organizations, I like, uh, I mean, the World Food Program feeds close to 30 million people a day out there, and that's pretty damn important, um, but we don't hear much thinking about that. Organizations, you know, like uh, CUSO uh, are, are are withering, unfortunately. I, I regret that enormously. I think the experience that that gave me and my colleagues at, at a formative young age was vital. 
in terms of understanding the world. I'd like to suggest Canadians get out there and travel, but as you just said, some of the more interesting places in the world are dangerous. Uh, and that makes all of that. But even to the less dangerous places is a start and a good place. So uh, Canadians to involve themselves internationally, to learn about what's happening, to learn what why other people tick the way they do, um, is, is, is vital. Um, uh, you know, uh, organizations like the Red Cross, like the Y, are terrific in terms of teaching community spirit, teaching uh, team spirit, and, and uh, to care about others more than just self. There's an awful lot of worry about self going on these days, and I wish it were otherwise. Um, you know, I, I think I mentioned to you first thing this morning that, that this terrific piece in The Atlantic by David Brooks, uh, uh, cor- main correspondent of The New York Times, um, on, uh, you know, kind of the, the theme of why have Americans turned so mean? Why is it? Why, 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 why have we lost that sense of community, that, that sense of decency, that sense of obligation to others? Um, and how do we get it back? I'd certainly commend that article. That's, that's great. Bob, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, I always learn so much from, uh, from you, and, uh, and I'm sure our listeners will as well. So thank you again. Chris, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. You can find information in the show notes on the genocide in Rwanda, Bob's memoir of his kidnapping by Al-Qaeda, the Ipsos poll on Canadian defense, and Bob's recommendation on David Brooks' article in The Atlantic. Thanks for listening to the NSP, and goodbye until next time.